Hello again, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to case study number 35. This will be a child coming in with fatigue and bruising, and you probably know where we're going with this. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the i button on the upper right hand corner. I really appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos, and I thank all those of you who have already stepped up to donate. Okay, we got a six-year-old East Asian American girl coming in with her mom complaining of fatigue and easy bruising over the last three weeks. Sorry, I crossed something out here. Mom says that about three weeks ago, she started noticing that the patient was unable to keep up with her friends and siblings like she normally could, and she would get easily tired. She's also napping more than usual. A few days ago, she noticed bruising on both of her arms, and she is unable to explain this as she's unaware of any injuries. Prenatal birth and postnatal history are uncomplicated. Patient has no significant past medical history. She's got two older siblings and a younger sibling, all with no medical issues. She's on no medications. She is tracking in the 50th percentile for weight and the 45th percentile for height. She's up to date on all vaccinations. And her vitals are interesting. Everything is normal, but she does have a fever. And uh, so we don't know how long it's been lasting. Okay, what are we going to do for our workup? All right, her general appearance is lethargic and pale. She's got normal turgor. She's got conjunctival pallor, but everything else is fine. No lymphadenopathy. Uh, she's cleared oscillation, no murmurs, um, and she's uh, got a normal abdominal exam. All right, we want to look at the extremities because she's got bruising. So we don't fi find any cyanosis. There's no clubbing. There's no edema, but she does have multiple bruises and petechiae on the elbows and knees. Typical place to get them uh, when you're a kid because they're exposed to trauma. What are we going to do? For, well, first of all, what's our differential? So this is a patient with anemia and probably thrombocytopenia because she's got platelet-type bleeding. That's bruising, petechiae, gum bleeding, menorrhagia, as opposed to factor-type bleeding, which is deeper. It's hemarthrosis, internal bleeding. Okay, so naturally, we're going to consider anemia. So iron deficiency, unusual in a kid, but we can consider it. Nutritional deficiency and hemolysis. Acute leukemia is always a possibility in a small child with bruising and fevers and anemia. Aplastic anemia is another possibility. It would be unusual. And then child abuse. Just because of the bruising, it's always something we do have to consider, even though it's pretty unlikely in this patient. So what are we going to do for our workup? Okay, because we are thinking something hematologic, we got to get a smear in addition to the CBC. We pretty much get CBC on everybody, but when you've got a strong suspicion of a hematologic disorder, particularly, you know, if a patient has anemia or bleeding or whatever, you got to get that smear. And you will have to order that in addition to the CBC on CS, uh, CCS. So very important that you order that because it'll give you some important information. We're going to get a BMP. We're going to get liver function tests. We're going to get PT, PTT. We're going to get a chest x-ray because she's got this unexplained fever. And for the same reasons, we're getting a urine culture, blood culture, and a lumbar puncture. All right, so basically everything is normal except her CBC is totally whack. So she's got a white count of 24.7, that is high. She's got a hemoglobin of 8.1, that is low. A hematocrit of 24.5, that's low. Platelets of 72,000, that is low. And this is why we got that smear. Presence of lymphoblasts, that should give you a suspicion of what we are dealing with here. This is likely leukemia. Okay, so our presumptive diagnosis is acute leukemia. We need to admit this patient not only because she's going to need further workup, but also because she's got that unexplained fever and probably has some sort of occult infection that we're not catching. Got to wait for the cultures to come back. Uh, we're going to refer or really get a consult at least from Heme Onc and the orders, broad spectrum antibiotics. She's got an unexplained fever, a likely diagnosis of uh, leukemia, so we're thinking a, uh, a leukopenic fever. So we need to do broad spectrum antibiotics. Ceftazidime is fine. You can go with cefepime as well. There's lots of broad spectrum antibiotics out there. Further workup, 
bone marrow. So bone marrow is the most accurate test for diagnosing leukemias. Um, so we need to get that. It'll also help us uh, rule out aplastic anemia and all that stuff. Uh, we're also going to get an LDH, uric acid, type and cross match in case she needs to be transfused at some point, and then a head CT looking for CNS involvement. All right, what do we find? Uh, so the bone marrow biopsy shows hypercellularity and 28% lymphoblasts. Anytime you're above 20%, you have a diagnosis of ALL. Okay, so diagnosis here is ALL. We're going to counsel the family, and then the treatment is going to be chemotherapy. Now, we give allopurinol first to prevent tumor lysis syndrome. So we induce, and by the way, I, I think it's very unlikely you're going to be asked about drugs for ALL because um, the recommendations are constantly changing. What you do need to know definitely for chemo regimens are Hodgkin's lymphoma and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, so that's very, very important for you to know. But this, probably not so much. So we induce with vincristine and steroids. That really has not changed. Um, the question is, what do we add to that? They're saying now asparaginase, uh, and you may or may not add down your rubicin. Now, what you do need to know, by the way, for... Um, really any step of USMLE is the side effects. So vincristine, peripheral neuropathy, dexamethasone, um, obviously, um, you know, you got your moon face, weight gain, stuff like that. Um, donurubicin, heart failure. Consolidation, we'll do high-dose methotrexate, maintenance, methotrexate, and or, or 6 mercaptopurine, And then we give all patients CNS prophylaxis with intrathecal methotrexate. ALL is a malignant clonal disease that starts with a progenitor cell, a lymphoid progenitor cell, and you know the story. There's a mutation or a translocation, and it proliferates, crowds out the bone marrow, causes the pancytopenia. Early lymphoid precursor cells replace the hematopoietic stem cells of the bone marrow, and they can infiltrate other organs that can cause the organomegalies. The peak incidence is one to four years. So this is a disease of very small children, and it is the most common pediatric malignancy. Out of the leukemias, probably about three quarters of them are ALL in children. The rest are AML. The best initial test is a CBC. We'll show the pancytopenia. However, your white count could be really high. Either way, it's a functional neutropenia because they're white cells. Either they're not enough or they're not working. The most accurate test is a bone marrow biopsy. It's needed to make the diagnosis. The most common presenting symptoms relate to the cytopenias. You know how those go. Anemia, fatigue and pallor, thrombocytopenia, bruising and petechiae, and leukopenia, infections and fever. Other symptoms can be organomegaly, bone pain due to the marrow expansion, and you can get generalized lymphadenopathy. Complications, leukostasis, particularly if your white count's going over 100. Infections and febrile neutropenia, uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit tumor lysis syndrome, and adverse effects of the chemo drugs. Common differentials, iron deficiency, we would expect to see that on smear, and we would also expect to see a low MCV. Nutritional deficiency would be unusual, uh, but you would see a high MCV. You could see hypersegmented neutrophils. Go ahead, get your serum B12, serum folate, MMA, homocysteine, all that stuff to work that up. Hemolysis, you tend to see jaundice, and the other cell lines would be fine. Aplastic anemia would look very similar. You'd have the pancytopenia, but on your peripheral smear, you would not see blasts, and your bone marrow biopsy would be hypocellular uh, rather than hypercellular. You wouldn't see any blasts. Child abuse, you'd have normal labs and probably some other findings, maybe fractures um, and burns and stuff like that. So to recap, ALL is the most common pediatric malignancy. The symptoms are typically related to the cytopenia, but you can have organomegaly, bone pain, and CNS features. Diagnose it, you would suspect on the CBC, which we get on pretty much everyone. You would confirm it on the bone marrow biopsy, more than 20% blasts. Treatment is chemotherapy, and there are a couple big complications. Tumor lysis syndrome, just think you're destroying cells, so everything that's in those cells in higher concentration, like phosphate, um, potassium, urate, and so forth, will spill into the bloodstream, cause electrolyte derangements and hyperuricemia, um, which can cause acute renal failure. To treat this, vigorously hydrate, give allopurinol, and collect, co correct the electrolyte abnormalities. Another big one, 
is neutropenic fever, which may have been presenting in this patient. So what you do there is you're going to get your entire workup for, um, for infection. So we're talking blood cultures, urine cultures, lumbar puncture, uh, and so forth. Get your chest x-ray. Um, and then as soon as we get those cultures, immediately what you want to do is IV broad spectrum antibiotics. So you can go with cefepime, you can go with Miram, you can go with Piptaz, lots and lots of options. Just make sure it's broad spectrum.